Hey, welcome to CNC Router Project Start to Finish. In this episode, we'll be looking at all the steps involved in the creation of this 5x7 photo frame. While many frames are composed of four separate mitered pieces, this one is made from a single, continuous piece of wood that's been machined on both the front and back surfaces. This project was cut from a 13-inch long piece of 1x12 radiata pine. The general shape of this frame was based upon an image file. I no longer have the original, but I've made a recreation in order to demonstrate the drawing approach. When tracing what's supposed to be a symmetrical object, I found it's not really desirable or necessary to draw the entire piece. This is partly because the reference photo is oftentimes slightly distorted. In the end, this would result in a vector that's also slightly distorted. The approach I usually end up taking involves drawing one quarter of the design and then using the mirror and join open vector functions to complete the remainder. So the first step is to position some guidelines that will assist in the drawing process. Specifically, I'm going to place both horizontal and vertical guidelines at the top center and right center of the object. Next, the curve or arc tool is used to trace the portion of the object between the two guideline intersections. With this particular piece of software, it's possible to draw only a few select arcs and then use the close vectors with a smooth curve command to join the segments. So I'm just going to repeat this process until the entire section is drawn. I'm not really going for perfection with the tracing, just basically trying to capture the essence of the design. Now it's time to use mirroring to complete the rest of the frame outline. First, however, I'm going to draw a straight line directly along the vertical guideline created earlier. This line will serve as an axis of rotation about which the existing frame vector will be mirrored. Next, both the vector and the line are selected together and the mirror command chosen. With the option for Create a Mirrored Copy selected, I'm going to choose the Flip About Line option. At this point, the two sides of the frame are still considered to be separate vectors. To join them together, I'm going to select them both and choose the Join Open Vectors command. Next, the bottom half of the frame outline is created in a similar fashion. This time a line is drawn along the horizontal guideline. Both the line and vector are selected, and Flip About Line is chosen from the mirroring options. Finally, the top and bottom pieces are joined together. Depending upon the reference photo that was used, the trace vector may or may not be the desired size. In this somewhat exaggerated example, the frame vector measures about 17 and an eighth inches by 10 and an eighth inches. Not only is this too large, but the aspect ratio is incorrect. For the frame in this video, I decided that an appropriately sized main opening would measure 4.5 inches by 6.5 inches. In addition, there would be a border thickness of an inch and a half on each side of the opening. At 1.5 inches per side, that would be a total of 3 inches larger than the main opening. This would put the dimensions of the outside vector at 7.5 inches by 9.5 inches. So to change this, I'm going to select the outside vector and choose the Set Size command. After deselecting the link XY box, the correct dimensions are entered and applied. So I went ahead and created a new project with a workspace equal in size to the workspace that's available on my router table and I've positioned a number of elements in this workspace. First, there's a rectangle that measures 13 inches by 11 and a quarter inches, and this represents the 13 inch long piece of 1 by 12 from which the frame will be cut. The location of the 1 by 12 on the spoil board here is completely arbitrary. It made sense for my particular situation, but it can really be placed anywhere. Next, there's a vector representing the outer portion of the frame, and another rectangle measuring 4 and a half inches by 6 and a half inches that depicts the main opening of the frame. 
These are centered both horizontally and vertically with respect to the piece of 1x12. There are also a total of eight 16th inch diameter circles that mark the location of the screws that will be used to hold the material down to the spoil board. Finally, there are two 3 8 inch diameter circles that are vertically centered and located 3 quarters of an inch from the edge of the material. These circles represent the location of dowel holes that will be used to maintain proper alignment of the material when it's flipped over to be machined on the back surface. So to create the pilot holes for the hold down screws, I'm going to use a drilling tool path. The tool selected is a 16th inch end mill and the cutting depth is set to a quarter of an inch. To form the outer edges of the frame, I'm going to be using a core box bit in a profile toolpath. The cut depth is set to a quarter of an inch, machine vectors are set to on, and the direction is set to conventional, as this seems to yield the best results when working with pine. I've also added a smooth ramp to the toolpath. For the main opening in the frame, I'm also going to be using a profile toolpath. This time I'll be using a quarter inch down cut for the bit, and cutting to a depth just over the three quarter inch thickness of the material. In this instance, machine vectors are going to be set to the inside. The direction is once again set to conventional and a smooth ramp is added. There are no tabs necessary in this case as there are two hold down screws in the middle of the material. A profile toolpath is also used to create the holes for the dowels. Once again, a quarter inch down cut bit is used. The cutting depth is set to an inch this time as the hole needs to extend through the material and into the spoil board as well. Machine vectors are set to inside and the direction is set to conventional. I've also added a ramp, but this time it's spiral in nature. Finally, we have one more profile toolpath that cuts out the frame itself. The bit is a quarter inch down cut and the depth is just over three quarters of an inch. Machine vectors this time are set to outside Direction is once again set to conventional, and a few tabs are added to the toolpath to keep the material in place. Finally, a smooth ramp is added. So that takes care of the front side of the frame. Now it's time to add two toolpaths for machining on the back side. When it's time to machine the back side of the material, I'm going to be flipping it horizontally on the spoil board. I'm also going to create a corresponding flip within the software. To represent that process, I'm going to select all of the vectors, choose mirror selected objects, and then the flip horizontal option. Due to the symmetry of most of the vectors in this design, I could probably get away without this step. Oftentimes though, that's not the case, so I try to get in the habit of doing this anyway. There's really only one required operation that needs to be performed on the back surface of the frame, and this involves widening the main opening so that it can accept the glass, mat, photo, and backing material. Since this is a 5x7, I need to make the opening at least that large. I'm going to oversize it just a bit and create a rectangle that's 5 and a 30 second by 7 and a 30 second. And then I'm going to center that up within the frame. What I'd like to do is create a toolpath that pockets out the area between these two rectangles. Before doing that though, I'm going to add some 16th inch radius dog bone fillets to the corners of the larger rectangle in order to work around the router's inability to cut square inside corners. Now I'm going to select the two rectangular vectors and create a pocketing toolpath. The depth is set to one half inch. And I ended up using two bits for this, a quarter inch bit for the clearance portion, followed by an eighth inch bit. It might have been more efficient and sensible to have created eighth inch radius dog bones and used only a quarter inch bit for this process, but I opted for the look of the smaller fillet. The final toolpath for the back side is a drilling toolpath used to create pilot holes for screws that will hold down the turn buttons. These are used to lock the contents inside the frame. I'm using one inch long turn buttons that I ended up placing along the long side of the frame an inch from the corner and three eighths of an inch from the edge of the pocket.
To hold the frame during the finishing process, I've made what are effectively mini expander bars out of some threaded rod and coupling nuts. These can be placed in the main opening on the back side of the frame and tensioned up. Now finish can be applied to all the major surfaces at once. These will leave a small mark, but since this area won't normally be seen, I'm not terribly concerned about it. I'm going to start the finishing process by applying two generous coats of pre-stain allowing each coat to soak in for 15 to 20 minutes. Directions suggest wiping off any excess after the final coat, but the radiata pine I've worked with has always absorbed it completely. For the stain, I've chosen to use Varathane's Early American. I'm just going to apply one coat, allowing the stain to penetrate for about three minutes. 
The way it worked out, by the time the second side application was complete, it was time to begin wiping the stain off from the first side. Sometimes a cotton swab can be helpful in removing excess stain from the corners. Finally, I'm going to apply two coats of satin polyurethane, two to three hours apart. After the polyurethane is completely dried, it's time to install the turn buttons. Now, all that's left is to insert the contents, snug the screws, and display your new frame.